What's up, Z-Pack? It's your boy, Z-Dog MD and Tommy T-Bones. What's up, guys? I just flew in and... <laughs> boy, boy, are my his arms, arms tired. tired. That's right. So... <laughs> We're doing this as a pre-recorded show that we're going to feed into you guys because we cannot figure out yet how to make this thing go live from this camera in this house in California where we are temporarily escamped. Is that the word? In camp. That's pretty good. Is it, I mean, I've coined something here. The Urban Dictionary when I'll say escamped. Escamp. You know, I like uh, the escampy, actually. <laughs> It's campy is Italian for the shrimps. Uh, you might. Uh, so we are uh, doing a Tom and Z morning rounds, but uh, we're doing it pre-record. We're testing out a little setup here while we get our new studio happening. We're still in Vegas until the 31st of August. But these guys came up. They want to hang out. They want to see what is the, how the other half lives. That's right. And so did I. So we set up right here. Yeah. And uh, we're doing this thing. What yeah. are we talking about today, Tom Hunterberg? We are going to talk about... Many things. Uh, you know what I want to ask? How do you like? How do you like being back in the Bay Area? I thought I would hate it. Uh, the house is uh, very tiny, but by Bay Area standards, it's okay. It's but large you know, by Bay Area standards. It's large. So the reason people but spend tiny by everybody else. By standards. everybody. Yeah. If you live in Columbus, Ohio, you're doing a lot better than Z in terms of square footage. A lot better. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Akron. <laughs> And Dayton, and uh, I'm looking at uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, and you guys would look at this house and be like, "That's a twenty thousand dollars house." Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in Grand Rapids, this house would cost one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. Oh my gosh! And in the Bay, I'm not going to tell you how much it costs, but it's. Let's just say I owned it in advance before it got crazy, and then we remodeled it, and now we're living in the remodel. And there's still people painting, so you might see people working. But we're going to have guests here that because it's nice. Because part of the reason I wanted to move back is. Better access to really good guests, a little different energy. My friends are here. The cul-de-sac where we are is lovely. The neighbors yeah. are like Googlers and Facebookers, and they're all kind of fun and interesting. Well, isn't that what it really is? Is like a lot of it is work-life balance, like hang out with your social circle and yeah, because, it, because you're willing to be here where you get less for your money. Yes, because all your friends are here. Right? Yeah, yes, and and I think so. What you get less for is house and aggravate. You get more aggravation. You yeah, have to sit in traffic. Like it took me an hour to get you guys from the airport, but it's worth it in that now you have a sense of community that's here. I think that's very nice. The weather is beautiful. The food is great, and there's a level of energy and. Uh, stimulation that is different and since i kind of grew up here 25 years all my all my deeper social networks here now the thing is right. i have to import you two motherfuckers because yeah. you know which i think you're right to say stay in vegas save money have a good lifestyle and then come up here and do your work i would never live here it's way too liberal here <laughs> and there's that uh, tom can't handle it i hate it because he doesn't like socialism no i hate it any place you go where kombucha is on tap on tap socialism's afoot <laughs> you know what it's like you know you see that <laughs> you see those spring break videos right right, where right. Blah, 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 blah. girls are taking off the top <laughs> here it's like a dude with a hipster goatee with his face under a kombucha tap and he's like my microbiome is blowing up spring break it's like it's a it's amazingly different you know what i'll say though is like culture is better in the bay yeah, it is better right. food. Yeah, yeah. That's about it. I mean, little. that's it. Yeah. You go down the street, the food's amazing. Right. Yeah. And people, at least where we live here, we can't say where I live because people will try to murder me. They, they, they are, uh, they're generally friendlier than in Vegas. In Vegas, people tend to kind of wall off their place. Well, you bit. had an interesting insight. One of your interesting insights that you told me was that uh, geographic location shapes, you know, community structures. And I had never really thought about it because like when you're out in West Texas or whatever, or you're in any rural community, because 20 minutes outside of any major city is basically Kentucky. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> so, you know what I mean? It's like when, once you're in that rural environment, you're like, I'm going to keep me and mine safe. Right. And uh, I'm going to shoot anybody who come and breach the perimeter. But when you're like living on top of each other, it's like, hey man, it's all cool. Like, you know. You have to be. You have to be. Yeah, you know, and this is this is why, okay, this is why ZPAC, I think it's so important to understand that everybody's doing the best they can and they have a belief structure that fits their geography and their culture and where they are. It's not saying all beliefs are equal. I actually do think there's some ways of being in the world that are probably better. Yeah. But there's no absolute. So it's right. In San Francisco Bay Area, to get along, you have to have a certain liberal mindset, I think, to to be able to tolerate the high amount of diversity without open warfare in the streets. I think where people in the middle of the country get upset about that, especially, especially is because Silicon Valley has such outsized power. Yeah. The people here have such outsized power because of the tech monopolies that 
they're inflicting their lifestyle on others and it's like yeah maybe not everybody wants that lifestyle it, the, the, the problem yeah. with folks here is they live in a bubble right. i know because i was in that bubble for 25 years when and I was, when, can i tell you this when yeah. i was in portland there was a sign that said due to patriarchy minimum credit charge is five dollars i was like yeah or due to visa's policy <laughs> <laughs> Maybe due to the International Bank of Settlements, not, you know, due, yeah, not due to patriarchy. Why, why stop at patriarchy? <laughs> Go right back in the timeline to, like, due to the Big Bang, uh, we yeah, right. charge a 3% credit card fee. <laughs> due to the fact that your carbon was synthesized in supernovas exploding, we go ahead and refuse the right to serve anyone. Um <laughs> It, it, it's crazy. Speaking of woo fuckery that, uh, <laughs> you know, finds its, finds its uh, tendrils wrapped around the Silicon Valley, Jessica Biel came, oh. came out recently. By the way, I love that you have to come out now. She yeah. came out as an anti-vaxxer. As an anti-vaxxer. This is like in the 90s what it was to come out as being gay. Except being gay is okay and being an anti-vaxxer is not this okay. It's not okay. <laughs> so yeah. you should stay the fuck in the closet, Jessica Biel. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I hate to Jessica Biel bash. Like, I hate to start a pogrom against Jessica Biel, but it is not okay. You well, should be societally shamed for why, what you're doing. Why do we think that Jessica Biel or Jenny McCarthy, why are we listening to hot people about science? If you're hot, you don't have to learn science. That's sort of the main benefit of being hot. So, know? wait a minute. You know, And the thing about Measy is I'm hot because I don't know I'm hot, and that's what makes me hot. You know what I mean? Tom Heinberg, what you're saying is I learned <laughs> science because I'm ugly. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> You're kind of right. Yeah. Because what else can you do? You're in you're in elementary school. You're not getting laid. You're like, I'm in third grade. I have yet to get laid once. And you're like, what am I going to do? I'm going to become a scientist because that's going to get me laid. Right? And it didn't work. But I, yeah, I don't understand. Why, why do we care? Of course, she's stupid. They're all stupid. Yeah, Everybody who's an actor is stupid. She's dumb as a rock. So yeah. today we're actually shooting a video about the Dunning-Kruger effect that has less to do with stupidity mm. than with willful, basically willful ignorance. I call that stupidity. You, you can call it what you will. <laughs> A dumbass by any other name, Tom Heinver, is uh, still an ignorant, uh, ignorant piece of shit. Okay, switching gears like rapidly. That was rapid. That was, I, you're I like a rapid cycling bipolar I haven't seen, manic. I haven't seen Zay in a while, so I got to tell him some stories. Okay, so check this out. I, I think I remember telling you the story that when I was in high school, I had a friend who was a low-level drug dealer, mm. and he got murdered. Did I ever tell you this no, story? Wait, 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 okay, well, that's crazy. A, yeah. first of all, what is a low-level drug dealer? You, just, you, know, sling, you mean low in the hierarchy? Slinging weed and ah, ecstasy and got it. You know, that kind of stuff. He wasn't like pushing hard drugs. It's like a suburban... Like SSRIs or... <laughs> <laughs> so, you, know, so, you know, a suburban right. drug dealer. Proton pump right. inhibitors, right. And he was like 17, and somebody killed him over Jeez. two grand and like a pound of weed and like some ecstasy pills so maybe wow. total street value of like eight thousand dollars they murdered him over eight thousand wow. dollars wow right and it the case went cold so they never found the guy and then just this week they caught the guy after 12 years oh my god yeah isn't that crazy? That, he, he threw the gun into a nearby artificial lake in vegas because it's vegas and the it lakes dried are not out real. and yeah, so they, they found it. They dredged the lake and they found the gun because apparently he had confessed to some guy who got popped for some, you know, however oh, it goes. Man. And the cold case team cracked it and now this dude is under arrest. Now, can I tell you, the reason it's interesting for me is, remember when Liam Neeson had that story where a friend of his was, you know, raped by a black guy and he was just wandering around looking for anybody who looked like that guy to, right, to, to go beat hurt, up. Yeah. to harm. I had this same initial instinct that this guy was black in his mugshot and just for like for this happened so transiently it was like for like maybe a second but i was just like fuck black people in my head wow and then i had to override it and be like no 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 i don't feel that way yeah but if i hadn't overridden it that thought might still be in my head it's, see <laughs> just that you say that already now i had to i had to re i had to i had to I don't know. There's something like in group about it because I had to go back. No, no, no. This is an individual. This individual is a murderer and this right, murderer right, killed my right. friend. But, but what's your so, instinct? It was yeah. so close and so personal to me that my instinct was like, fuck everybody yeah, okay. that looks like this guy. It's, Not even just fuck this guy. And, 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 and for, I th for a second. It, and, and, I got over it real quick. And, and I think people who say that doesn't happen to them are lying. Right. That's why I'm talking about it because it's like, it's real. It's like a real thing. It's a thing real thing. And the, but but, yeah. but where you become an advanced human is where you recognize it, you don't act on it, and you reframe it. And you go, right. no, no, actually, I see what's happening here. It's my monkey mind doing this crazy shit yeah. that I'm probably evolved to do. 
in-group, out-group is a big thing. We were talking about towns in Texas, why they might be more conservative. Well, in a town in Texas where if you call the police, it's going to be 30 minutes before someone can get to your house, yeah. it makes a lot more sense to have a weapon in your house to defend yourself. And the cohesion of the town depends on in-group versus out-group because you're so geographically isolated historically. So all of that thinking actually is adaptive in a town like that. It's no longer necessarily adaptive in the 21st century right. when we're all connected. But the residual of it is part of who we are. Now, Liam Neeson took a lot of shit for even saying that. Yeah. And in fact, I was hesitant to say it just now that I felt that way. But I was like, it's important to say because this is a thought pattern that's emerging uh, in the human species. And when I was a kid growing up uh, in the 70s, you know, civil rights, uh, the feminist movement, all these kind of things were just coming, Still, they were still broiling. And I remember being conditioned because there was so much stuff on TV about racism, I started to learn, oh, there are differences between races. And then I started getting conditioned that, oh, you know, why are black people having such trouble? You know, is there something wrong with them? Like that's, I remember this conditioning. Right. And I would watch basketball games and I would, uncon I would consciously go, oh, there's white guys and black guys. I wonder if the white guys are better. Like yeah. that's how your brain works. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. We, one time me and Logan were doing a business deal and uh, you know, went as far south as a business deal could go. And this guy, you know, fucked us out of a bunch of money, et cetera. And he was a Mexican guy. And I had to fight off the feeling of like, fuck Mexican people for like a week. I had to fight that yeah. feeling to overcome it. it, it and and it, I had, it was an active process. And people who think, though, this is a white privilege thing or some shit like that, it's total bullshit. No, everybody like, feels this way. The about. most racist I've ever felt yeah. is against white people. Because <laughs> yeah. hey, it comes up every now and again, like, especially when I was younger, I saw, I just be like, God damn it, like these white people, they just, they, they do these certain things. It's so hard to deal with them. They right. have these crazy rituals I don't understand. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so, and but what the thing is, like on social media, that kind of racism gets a pass. Like the chick from the New York Times or whatever. Yeah, Sarah Jong. Right, yeah. right, right. She's saying all these terrible things. And look, this is how, and I'll tell you because I'm, I, I, I would roll in these circles. Like Asian people talk about white people that way. It, it's like a thing. And is it racism? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One, well, Dave Chappelle had this thing where he was like, uh, you know, I used to think that racism was a much more uh, prevalent issue until I heard the rich whites call the poor whites trash. Yeah, I remember that. And it's yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's not one race against the other race. It's everybody In out. In group, for, out group. In yeah, group, it's out everybody group. out for themselves also. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So here's the thing. Why do you talk about it? Why do you uh, dredge it up? Because we have to recognize it as a behavior. And until, cause I, this is what I think. I think a lot of the hate, especially that's directed at uh, public figures, like, you know, whether it's Rogan or right, us right. or whoever, it's from, I think, relatively liberal uh, white people mm -hmm. who are still very unconsciously upset or feeling bad about, you know, historical stuff or even current unconscious bias. Yeah. The truth is, why, why feel bad about it? Recognize it and transcend it. You don't have to go through these elaborate rituals of denial yeah. to address it. Well, one of the reasons I bring it up is because I think the most, the, the, you know, the thing that we never give any time or credence to is just how you can have a destructive thought latch on to you and you can keep it with you your entire life like a parasitic organism yeah that's true and it can it can breathe its last breath with you yeah you know what i mean if that doesn't scare you that you're <laughs> thinking incorrectly yeah and that that thinking could ruin your entire life uh, you should be much more scared you should be you should be terrified. much more scared you should be yeah. terrified of that and you know like meditation gets a bad rap because people are like okay why do i need to meditate just to like zen out and be whatever the reason you need to meditate, and like Z talks about meditation, is a much bigger meditator than I am, uh, or will ever be probably. But the reason to meditate is to get a step back from your thoughts, because your thoughts are just like coming at you like a wave day after day after day. And some of those thoughts cling to you like a parasite, and they stick with you. And you, like I've had destructive thoughts that I've just kept inside for, for decades, you know? Even just very simple thoughts from childhood, like I'm not good enough, or I'm mm -hmm. not worthy enough, or I, sh I, sh my job is not to be happy. My job is to sacrifice for other mm -hmm. people. These kinds of things I kept with me until very recently when I was just like, whoa, that's just a thought pattern that I can change. I can just start in my head being like, I'm a happy person. I deserve to be happy. You know, I'm having a good time here in life with all the people around me, et cetera, et cetera, instead of thinking so negatively all the time. And people hate to hear that. They hate to hear like, you can change it just by thinking differently, man. It's the same as like, you can get skinny just by going to the gym, man. Right, but it's right, like, right, hey, right, right, right. 
Simple stuff is true. So, Cliches yeah, are true. The, 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 the metaphor of parasite is a, is a very good one. I think we're, I, okay, so, because the other day I talked about this uh, transforming thought pattern. Look, if you find a bright spot in a negative situation, yeah. it sounds cliche, it sounds trite, but what it does is, for a second, the valence of that emotion or that thought becomes a happy valence. The happy valence doesn't, we don't cling to those, they evaporate. That's what Naval Ravikant was saying. Right. So since they evaporate, you've actually diffused that thought by giving it a quick positive spin. It's not a trite thing, it's not a useless exercise. So, oh, I see a big gash in my newly refinished wall. Right. Bright side, I have newly refinished walls. Who gets to do that? This is great. So instead of perseverating on, there's an imperfection in the stuff I paid a lot of money for, now I go, God, I'm kind of lucky for to, to have this thing, but then I don't even think about it anymore because the happy thoughts evaporate. Yeah. That's a conscious thought pattern. Now, now, where you said like, oh, just go to the gym, do this, where I think people have trouble with these trite ideas is that they do require repetition and work. Yeah. It's not magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, discipline equals freedom. Discipline equals freedom, that's right. I mean, look at medicine, like how much discipline we have to have to get to where we are. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine if you could apply some of that to your thought processes. To meditation. So do you know, you, obviously, you know what compounding is, right? Compounding is just taking, you know, a, a sum of money, earning interest on that sum of money, and then reapplying the interest, right? right? And then the more you do that, that this is how people get rich. I don't think everybody knows this, but compounding is the one mental model that all rich people are using to be rich. Right. It's, money makes money, makes money, makes money. Yeah. And yep. from compounding, you get the time value proposition of money and everything that stems from that. Okay. But compounding is not just a financial... Um, mental model. You can apply compounding to almost every aspect of your life. Think about every positive relationship you have. Like, do you like being married? Yes. Yes. Why? Uh, because it's a partnership where the sum of the parts is greater. I mean, this, the, the, the result is greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. And yeah. do you think your marriage is better than when you first got married? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Because of increased trust. Yeah. So that's the compounding relationship ah. in the marriage. Ah, so you know, you know, actually there's another way to phrase this. Compounding is a good term because it, it actually has applicability in the practical world. I call it momentum or intention. And what happens is if you set something on a certain path, it actually tends to snowball. So yeah. an intention- Snowball helps effect that. is another way to say compounding. compounding. It's all the same. It's all the it's same all the same model. thing. So, totally. you know, these little uh, course adjustments we make lead us in a way that actually creates momentum. So right. that's why I think the practicing, uh, looking at bright spots, reframing thoughts, cognitive behavioral therapy is another way way to do this more formally going to any kind of therapy meditating there's a million ways to do it for instance i've been tracking calories on my fitness pal just like nutrition macros calories keeping it pretty basic and man you find out when you do that when you track everything you put in your mouth and you're honest about it there's a lot yeah well not only that but little like just one or two bad decisions mm. can ruin your week right 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 and that's all it is. That's like, all it is, if yeah. you just stick to it, you're right. going to lose weight, but you have to, you got to, you got to stick to work. it. work. People don't yeah. want it to be hard. There was an article that somebody sent me in the Facebook messages about, which by the way, one thing about Facebook messages, I get a billion of them. And sometimes I complain about it because it's always, you know, 90% of them the same shit. Like, right, have right. you done a video on this? Have you done a fucking Google search? Do a Google search and I get really upset because I'm like, I, I want to get to the gems in this yeah, yeah. and I have to read all the same, same old crap. Have you done a version of OPP called APP about advanced practice providers? <laughs> I'm like, if I get one more fucking OPP recommendation, I'm gonna murder everybody. Everybody loves to do you down with OPP because you can turn OPP into, into anything. You down with yeah. EKG? Oh yeah, you know me. <laughs> I got the AFib. And so anyways, I digress. Within those Facebook messages, which is why I love them, there are pearls. So someone sent me an article, I don't know if it was in the Atlantic or where it was, but it was how American patients are the worst in the world. It was an op-ed. Mm. It's basically saying, we want a lot of treatment, but we're not compliant with the treatment that actually we need. Yeah. And doctors are stuck in this position where they have to make us happy, but not necessarily keep us well. And so patients, which, which we don't focus on as part of the problem, are a huge part of the problem. And the reason is we've all been conditioned. So we behave you know, incorrigibly, and we all see this in healthcare, right? Now, the problem with this article is it was so slanted towards the do stuff to people. Well, well the doctors are always right. So we're just, you know, of course you should be on a statin. Right. Maybe you should just not eat shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you should de-stress. Maybe you should exercise a little more. Like that's not rocket well, science. A, I mean, there's a how many diet books are in yeah. the diet book section? There's Jeez. thousands, millions of diet books. Guess what? 
calories in calories out like the less calories you eat you're gonna lose weight and yes you should be eating nutritious food yeah. and you know vitamins then, and minerals but if you're talking about just pure weight gain like you want to drop weight eat less food <laughs> it's not that hard that's that's the simple thing and the pro and there's a lot of it's the simplest thing that's very complex to actually pull off for people. yes so i the, find the nutrition aspect of that kind of stuff to be more dependent on my mood right which is a part of well-being right 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 but uh, if you just want to simply lose weight right you can right do right. that just by eating less calories right and then the question is can you find hacks that work with your personality that would allow that to happen yeah yeah and i think like you know intermittent fasting or keto or all these things they're all just different hacks people use just find one that works and probably it's going to change over time but if you're not checking yourself that's the whole problem right Right, yeah, like yeah, if, yeah. if I had heard about my friend who was murdered by this guy and I saw this guy's mugshot and he was a black guy and I thought to myself, fuck black people. Mm. And I left that thought unchecked. Mm. It's going to fester. It's going to destroy my momentum. Whole life. It's going to destroy my whole life. Compound. Yeah, because not only am I wandering around looking for hate with every black person that I encounter, but, you know, it's not okay to be racist. So people are going to ostracize me. As do, you, well. do, you, do you think that's what happened to people who are like in the KKK and these people? Do you think something happened to them early on and they... There's a lot of literature that says that the people that are in the KKK like just find community there because of how badly broken their uh, home environments right, are. Right, right, right. And that afterwards they, you know, soak up more of the ideology, ideology of the group. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, like a brainwashing right, cult, cult right. type type of thing. Yeah. But yeah. it's easy to get there. Yeah, no. the thing. Because it's easy. these thought patterns are incredibly destructive. And as humans, we are social creatures. So we will absorb those things. We mm -hmm. do look for community, uh, especially the ones that are ostracized from general community. Right. Yeah. Thinking uh, about the way you think is like... Metacognition. The key to everything. Metacognition yeah. is everything. Uh, it's in fact the nature of the Dunning-Kruger effect, which we'll talk about on the separate video. Right, that's true. The lack of medical Because if you knew what you didn't know. Yeah, then yeah. you're done. And actually, I, oh, we got a lot to talk about with that. So. And that's hard to do too. And like, you know, because everybody wants you, if you, if you don't have an answer for something, you look weak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. hard to just be like, I don't know. Yeah. I haven't looked into it. I haven't studied that. Doctors, I don't care about that. Doctors have a real problem. Yeah. They'll, they'll go, well, you know, it's this. And then you know what happens is patients aren't dumb. They go and they look, they do research, they start digging stuff right. up. They don't know enough to frame it. And they go, well, the doctor told me they, it's this, but it might be this or this or this or this. So now I've lost trust in the doctor. When the second part of Dunning-Kruger or the attached part of Dunning-Kruger is the imposter syndrome, which is, right. is the yin to Dunning-Kruger's yang, which right. is you are a doctor, but part of you feels like you're still not and you don't deserve to be where you're at. Correct, right? correct. And I think what it is is people with very little expertise overestimate their expertise. Yeah. People with a fair bit of expertise underestimate really how much they know, but not to the, to the degree that they overestimate what other people know. Right. So they assume everybody knows somewhat what they know. And that the imposter syndrome comes from, oh, I'm not all that smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, even though I've been working on this for all my life. Joe Rogan has this joke that's like, it's just confidence. That's how you become king of the dum-dums, you know, because <laughs> you just have three dumb people in a room and it's just like, do you know what's going on? No, I don't know what's going on. Do you know what's going on? I'm pretty sure I think I know what's going on. You know, it's, that's all it takes. And then and you then triple down like, on it. Follow me. Yep. You know, let's triple go down on way. it. Yeah yeah. 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 So what do you think? Did this little episode, um, did we, is this a, how does it look, Logan? Is it, say hi, Logan. Come out here. You got to like. Give the people what they want. <laughs> yeah, you got to give them what they want. <laughs> they want Logan. <laughs> Uh, Logan's gonna set up a sniper shack right out there. Hey, so when are all these guys gonna be out of your house and everything? Hopefully in the next week. Okay. Yeah, and then I'll be they back in like Vegas. They seem like they're doing a good job. Like everything looks good. They're doing great. Yeah. I have to say the craftsmanship of these guys, like people who uh, do construction mm -hmm. at a high level are like really, it's really impressive. Yeah, most yeah. of them don't do it at a high level. That's why it's impressive when you do it at a high level. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of, like I, I like the foreman uh, is this guy Eric uh, and I think uh, I think he's Mexican or Honduran I can't figure it out but right. he uh, approaches everything with this like level of like he cares deeply about it being right and so he'll talk to you and he'll be like, he'll walk around and he'll be like oh, I don't like this I'm gonna redo this isn't that the whole thing though yeah do your shit right not he, just <laughs> try just caring yeah. Carrying, there was a there was a guy recently who um, stood on a street corner and said, "I'm homeless." He was wearing a suit and a tie, and he said, "Take a resume. I don't want anything from you. Take a resume. Uh -huh. I need. I'm looking for a job." Interesting. Guess what happened? He gets a job. He got hundreds of applications wow. for jobs. Wow. And it's almost like so weird, Z. It's almost <laughs> like <laughs> when you care, yeah, and you want to better yourself, people are there to help you. Yeah. 
What? So crazy, right? No, maybe we should have the government get involved. It's like, how do you how do you fix what's inside? This is my whole thing. This is what I'm trying to talk about the whole time. The metacognition angle. How do you fix what's inside of people's heads and get them to care about their own life? You, <laughs> you know, if you solve that, how do you problem, get a patient to well, care well, about their own life? Right. How do you get? You know what I mean? Well, first you have to emotionally resonate with them. You have to connect with them, and they have to trust you, and then. They have to kind of start absorbing some of the little things you're dropping. You can't overwhelm them, and it's it, and you have to, and they have they have to be convinced that you care because yeah. then then there's a connection. So you know, like the show, I get messages all the time. Oh, I changed this, or I've changed my way of thinking, or this happened because of something I saw of yours, and I wanted to thank you. Those messages, I always try to respond and say, Hey, listen, you in turn have now created a feedback loop, well, right? I'm inspired because some there are days when I wake up, you know it. I, I'll just be like, Tom and Logan, I'm out. I'm done. <laughs> I hate this shit. I'm not good at it. I shouldn't be doing it. People do it better than me. Why am I here? Everyone hates me on Twitter. Everyone hates me on Facebook. I'm worthless. I'm an imposter. That's a part of your process, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that is. It is. Exactly. Here I am in a fucking Tabasco shirt <laughs> in a in a at addition to my, you know, third rate Bay Area home is full of termites. It's, but was, it's just so it's so hard and yeah. like that's the whole thing yeah, yeah just correcting what's in people's heads is the whole thing this week has been an exercise for me in exactly that because yeah. there are times when i just fall into despair because i'm like oh it's a process of moving and the chaos and you feedback you know family members are unhappy like she's not happy with you know how things are settling and this is not and you just go uh, <laughs> you just want to burn everything down but then you take some time in the morning to meditate and you start reframing things and you go, oh, oh, Tom and Logan are coming up. We're going to have fun. If we do nothing else, we'll go eat at a nice restaurant. Yeah. And the, you know, the social connections and that uh, piece of it is what make us happy anyways. So that's really what it matters. And then you start to come out of it. But yeah. it takes work, man, the metacognition. One of the things I like is like, okay, first just realizing is is key. And that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, oftentimes it, it's foisted upon you, right? Right, yeah. Like, uh, and some people will never learn. I Adversity mean, can foist it on you. Yeah. Yeah, big disaster. Like, here's something that nobody wants to talk about, but I'll say it, is uh, homeless people are assholes. Like, almost all of them. Those that are not mentally ill are assholes. And that's the reason they're homeless, is because nobody will let them sleep on their couch. If you suddenly lost everything, you're not going to be homeless tomorrow because you can come sleep on my couch. If Logan lost everything tomorrow, he's not going to be homeless because he can sleep on my couch. If most of the people listening, same thing. Homeless people burn all their bridges. Now, if it's because they're mentally ill, then yes, I have great sympathy for them. All right, so yeah, so let me frame a little bit. it's just like, because they're disagreeable pieces of shit, <laughs> then I have so, no sympathy. Yeah, let me frame. If you're not mentally ill... And, and by the way, the majority of homeless people are mentally ill. So yes. there's, and there's have had- Do you count drug addiction as a mental illness? Uh, it depends on the etiology of it, but right. it can be, yeah. And, and so, so, okay, so these are things that now are like, it's a medical condition. Now for the, for the few that aren't, I think you're not entirely wrong. There's something going on, whether it's a personality disorder or some other issue where they're unable to function adequately because it's America. Okay, let, let me say this. Now people are gonna hate this. I'm gonna say this directly to the audience because it's something I believe. When I, in, in the 80s and 90s, I used to go back and forth to India because that's where my family's from. Oh, yeah, yeah. And By the way, I just watched Slumdog Millionaire last oh, night. Oh, it's so good. I love the way the guy pronounces millionaire. He's like, who wants to be a millionaire? <laughs> <laughs> it's the best. You know what's better than Slumdog Millionaire, though, is uh, Monsoon Wedding because that shit is legit. Oh, can the, I say this real quick, though? Yeah. The point of Slumdog Millionaire is that the only reason he's able to win the game show is because his life experiences led, led him, him to, to that. that. Right. You know what I mean? That's right. It's, that's momentum. Exactly, it's, it's momentum. It's compounding. It's, it's, it's destiny. It's destiny. Yeah. You know, people who say, oh, the universe led me to this. It's called momentum compounding intention. It's yes. not the fucking universe. It is the universe because everything's the universe. But again, back to first principles. Because right. of the big bang, we're going to charge a 3% credit card fee. So, so... To, so I would go back and forth to India, and what I would see is abject poverty on a level where anybody in India could be on the street mm -hmm. and because there were just so few resources, especially back then. And, and this is why I respected my dad because he always feared instability. So at any point, he could be on the street in his mind. So it was always like, be as cheap as possible. Yeah, Don't yeah. spend money on stuff. What do you mean you're going to quit your job and move to Las Vegas to start a show and a clinic? Are you crazy? Like, you could be on the street. 
That is true situational poverty and homelessness, and it's very hard to rise out of that. Now, then I come back to the U.S., and again, you get hit up by some guy in the street, and you're like, bitch, you are living the dream compared to India. Right. Right. Now, you're mentally ill. You need a lot of help. That's a different thing. But there is a, in America, it, again, if you're not a complete asshole, you can at least potentially have a roof over your head. Now, people will disagree. They'll say, yeah. no, you don't understand these environmental issues and the effect of racism and the effect of this. That's a, in the end, I'm just going to say it's a fucking cop out. We need to, we need to stand up and say, listen, there is a degree where people have to stand up and take, take responsibility. Personal responsibility. Now, yeah. again, I will absolve people <laughs> who are mentally ill and these kind of things because, because you, I see it and I know that it's hard. At the same time, a moderate stance is you got to fucking, take control of your shit. I always feel like I'm allowed to say this because my mother is so severely mentally ill that like if she didn't have me looking after her, she'd she, be homeless. She would be on the street. Mm. But I look after her right. because I'm not expecting some fucking government agency to do it. Mm. No, it's part of the family structure and I look after her. Do I want to? Fuck no. I fucking hate it. <laughs> I hate having to be having, you know, responsibility for somebody that, because of the conservatorship laws and because of gravely disabled and how they haven't yet to expand it anywhere, mm. that I have almost no um, accountability for. Like, I can't just tell her what to do. Mm. I, I have no control over my mother, but I have responsibility for her. Mm. That's horrendous. Anybody mm. who's living a situation like that, that's basically like a type of... It's like a type of servitude. It's like indentured servitude. Mm. You know what I mean? Now, so I do feel like I can say this... And that other people should step up to the plate and get it handled. And, and I'll be unpopular and counter and say, well, it's because you're privileged and your dad was a lawyer and so you could step up and take care of her. What about people who can't? I would do it anyway. Like, mm. it, it's not about money. Mm. Money, you know, most of, the, most of it is time. Mm. It's my time. And that is money, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not money that keeps her from living on the street. It's time you taking her to the appointment it's me taking her make sure she's medicated right. taking her to her appointments right that just takes me driving her and making it fucking happen right 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 you know right, I mean? right right money does nothing right yeah. you can't buy your way out of that problem actually no you can't yeah you can't you know it's just like people say oh moving moving's an ordeal just throw some money at it some yeah. people have said this to me it doesn't work no it doesn't work it's still a fucking ordeal yeah uh, and as, that's not a great analogy, but one thing I've recently gone through this. One thing that's interesting, uh, because you said this is like, you know, your father was super risk at first. Yeah. But probably, still is probably to the point where it was detrimental to him. Oh, a hundred percent. He has lost millions of dollars in potential retirement savings because he's too risk averse. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something I think that often happens is that people find themselves uh, in one area of life. Like, let's say, you know, he was in India and he saw all the poverty. And with my family, it was because of the Great Depression. Right. And so we had, my father was very risk adverse and his grandmother, or my grandmother, even more so risk adverse. But they find themselves on one end of the spectrum and they say, okay, well, this place I'm at is no good. Mm. So I'm going to swing all the way to the opposite zone. Right. And the truth is usually it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. You have to have flexibility on, you know, you can't just be one way or the other. You have to be situationally dependent. So have some impulse control. Me and you is, I think something we share is because we're the sons of men who are, who of men who are incredibly (laughs) risk adverse. What we do, I've noticed is I, I watch you do it all the time. You take care of existential risks up front and then you let good things compound Mm. in the future and i do the same thing and Ex- is, explain that like this is a conversation we always we always have that mm. i don't think normal people have and you mm. probably don't recognize it all mm. the time is we always talk about worst case scenarios up front right and most people don't do that most mm. people just think we're gonna put in a pool it's gonna be great you know <laughs> but your version of we're gonna put in a pool is gonna be great it's like, Fuck, i gotta get the permit and then what if this happens what if the pool leaks and then my neighbor 10 years from now and then this guy and then the pool is gonna need to be replastered but you know what now that I've thought about all that, let's get a pool. It'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't notice I do that. That's just true. No, that's just the way yeah. you think. Even the decision to move here, remodel this place, do all that. We went through all the disaster stuff up front. Okay, we can't move in. This doesn't happen. The permits of place full of termites, all this stuff. All right. Are we okay with all this risk? Yes, we are. All right, then let's do this. And then it's just like full steam ahead. A lot of that is because, you know, you got your dad's voice in the back. Dad's of your voice head. in the back. That's like, hey what oh you don't think that this is a free ride buddy forget about the back of the head okay i called him i said listen <laughs> we're thinking of moving back to to a bay area remodel the house this that he said have you thought about not doing that yeah because you are now settled you have a nice house and the 
team is there. What are you going to do with Tom and Logan? And I said, fuck Tom and Logan. They're little bitches. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I said, they can come. We'll make it work. He's like, oh, I don't know about that. So every day, every time, so how's the remodeling? Have they burned your house? Do you have insurance? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you know, but yeah. it kept me from because I have impulse issues too. So if I didn't have that dad, I'd probably be in jail or something. Totally. Well, yeah. no, it's it is it is beneficial. It's a beneficial thought pattern yeah. if you do it with flexibility. Right. So like you've taken it, and what you've done is you use it to limit downside risk up right. front. Right. Right. And then you let the upside risk run. Where people get fucked up with it is they'll say, "I'm going to limit all risk right. all the time, yeah, hundred percent." And then you're just not living. No reward. Yeah. No living. Yeah. That's the thing. Naval uh, Ravikant in that uh, interview said, uh, he quoted Confucius, right? He said, right. a man lives two lives, and the second starts when he realizes he has only one he life. He has only one. Yeah. Totally. And uh, That was a great benefit of my father dying, was, mm. you know, he died at 66, and my great-grandmother had lived to be 102. Mm. So we had this sort of thought germ in our family that was like, we live a long time, you know. Plenty we're, of time to do Plenty stuff. of time to do what we're going to do. So right? much room for activity. And then my father died at 66, mm. and I was like, fuck, I could die too. Better get on that shit, you know. And the next thing you know, so what does Tom do? He buys a motorcycle. That's right. Uh, it's sick. Yeah, yeah, he increases his risk uh, up to 27, has a baby. <laughs> That's the riskiest thing you can do. And uh, no, it's great. It's actually great. I yeah. think that that kind of perspective is important. The understanding your mortality. That's why middle middle midlife crisis has happened. When, when, one of the things I like from that Naval Ravikant Joe Rogan interview is he talks about social construct uh, contracts. And so once you do have the realization that you do X, Y, and Z, and you want to change it, how are you going to change it? Oh, you tell and people what, publicly. What people do is they go on Facebook and they say, "I'm going to drop thirty pounds by this date." And then people show up, yeah. you know, people ask you and they're like, how's your weight loss going? Yeah. And you're like, ah, uh, and you're thinking back on you eating Oreos last yeah. night and you're like, not great. So the next day you go and you actually work out, you know, this is uh, absolutely true because we're social creatures, tribal creatures. Uh, honestly, if I didn't do this show and know you guys are looking at me and going, hey, why is that fat ass telling me how to lose weight? <laughs> I would probably be 400 pounds right now because I like food. When this this goes into the, the point of like, we can use the systems that we were given ag against uh, themselves. Right. You know? or, or for our benefit. Or for our yeah, benefit. for our benefit. Either way. Well, this is this is where you and I have had this conversation, a running thing. It's like a conservative liberal conversation. Yeah. How much do you social engineer systems and environment and how much do you rely on internal uh, momentum and, mm. and responsibility. I think it's a mix of those things. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying don't engineer. I'm just saying know that in your engineering, that your engineering is fallible. Yeah. That you cannot account for black swans, unknown unknowns. Right, right, right. That's all I'm ever really saying. But nobody who has the chutzpah to top down architect some system thinks that they're wrong. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. they put in the system into place and they're like, it can never fail. The housing market can never yeah. collapse nationwide. There it goes. And there it goes. There it goes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Because Agreed. We don't build anti fragile systems. Right. They're you all uh, tremendously fragile. This is and why healthcare this, is a big one. Yeah. There's this like fear that China's gonna take over America. China will never fucking take over America because China's fragile. You can't talk bad about the Chinese government. America is anti-fragile. All we do is talk bad about the government all day long. Mm. China is never going to innovate, and they're never going to beat us. Until they until they uh, progress politically, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's say they suddenly have an American-style government. Now, the thing is their culture is I'm saying with their America. current structure. Yeah, with their current structure, never. Yeah, but I agree. But it's going to be very tough to break because America was almost like this, like, just immaculate rebooted yeah well it, it was like an immaculate conception it was the only time we ever in the history of humanity were able to start a place from scratch and we got lucky that the founding fathers like really were well you know well thought out systems architects who had studied uh, the greek system the english system and put into place a system that works really really well are yeah. there problems yeah of course yeah. but it's the slavery best. wasn't a nice thing. It's the yet. best system we've ever created. Yeah. And the idea that like anybody can move here and just, you know, hew to American principles and ideals and get ahead. Like that's so fucking beautiful. It makes me want to cry. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And and people people who, you know, this is this is one of the diseases of the far left. Yes. They yeah. will attack that idea as rotten at the core because of things like slavery. There's just a bunch of white men who mm -hmm. are slave owners and they put these tools of oppression in place. Like because fuck, of the patriarchy. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah. Like shut the hell up. This is still and immigrants will tell you this. Yeah. The same immigrants that you think you're protecting 
like that you think you're advocating for, right? Yeah. When, when you're espousing there, a very far left view. There's a billionaire of every race and every gender. Right. right. They, they will be the ones who will tell you to just shut the fuck up and let <laughs> us work. Right. Because we will fucking kick ass and we will succeed. Yeah. Yeah. But again, you know, I think, again, the truth is right in the alt center. It is. Uh, the alt center. You got to be flexible, man. You got no one to hold them and no one to fold them. Yeah. <laughs> Kenny Rogers is sick as fuck, apparently. What? I've been reading People Magazine in the checkout aisle and maybe actually buying it and reading it on the pot because I have a bidet and it shoots warm water in my butthole. Maybe it's time to fold him. It may be time to fold him because he's sick. He's not well. He might die soon, in which case That's sad. we're going to have to do a parody That's of Coward of the County. <laughs> you, know, you know what? Actually, I want to leave people with this. If you think that you can't change because of the people around you, they expect you to be some certain way or something... When Kenny Rogers dies, and yes, it will be a national tragedy. No one's going to give a fuck. <laughs> when Z told me just now, I thought he was already dead. If I'm being honest with you. Nobody cares. Listen, it's like this. Like, you, Do you think you're going to have a legacy after you die? Whoa. So all the people who have yet to be born are going to know you, but 99.999% of the people alive now don't know you? No. You're going to have no legacy. Fucking live your life now. Correct your shit now. You have the freedom to be who you want to be. Life is paradox. We are nothing and everything. And because of the Big Bang, we're going to be charging a 3% supporter tax on this show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, patriarchy. Speaking of patriarchy, yeah. support the patriarchy of two, a white and an off-white male doing a show by becoming a supporter for yeah. $4.99 a month. Send us stars, which mm -hmm. is a new way of tipping us. It's like a tip jar. It's like, oh, my God, look at that it's cute homeless best. guy. Here's $5 in stars. <laughs> and I'll read your comment and respond as Doc Vader. Uh, I don't know, Tom Heinemer, did we do it? Are we out? We're out. Logan? We're out. Yeet. Yeet! Love you guys. Peace. <laughs> Woo -woo. Sorry, Kenny Rogers.